This is the greatest force ever applied to move a vehicle. This is the cluster of rocket engines boosting the Saturn vehicle free of gravity, straight up. Saturn is the largest rocket ever produced by the United States. Not a military rocket, Saturn was designed solely as a space vehicle. It can carry multi-ton payloads into Earth orbit or to the moon. And the scientific space exploration by Saturn rockets will lead eventually to placing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Yet in the wake of World War II, United States developmental efforts were largely directed at producing military rockets. In these early years, there were several groups doing research to develop useful rocket vehicles, rapidly extending the base of our knowledge, developing new technology, creating experience and skills from which we might ultimately move to space flight. From one of these groups came the first true space flight in the world. On February 24, 1949, a WAC corporal placed a payload outside of the Earth's atmosphere. In 1950, the Army Research Group moved to Redstone Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama. Here, the successful Redstone and Jupiter missiles were developed by the United States Army. The Redstone and Jupiter, the grandfather and father of the Saturn. For during their development, the scientific base and technological know-how necessary for Saturn I were obtained. In 1953, the United States fired its first true ballistic missile, the Redstone. Redstone contributed heavily to the technical capability of the infant American rocket industry. Thus, later, the intermediate range ballistic missiles and the larger intercontinental missiles could dwarf the performance figures of earlier rockets. The Army initiated the Jupiter program in November 1955 to provide, at the earliest possible date, an intermediate-range ballistic missile to travel as far as 1,500 miles. The Jupiter is powered by a 150,000-pound thrust rocket engine. The March 1 launching was the first time in the Western world that a motor of this size and thrust had ever operated in a ballistic flight. Launch and flight for 72 seconds were excellent, at which time the missile went out of control and exploded. Although it did not go full range, it was an extremely valuable research and development firing. The missile continued to broadcast complete telemeter data until the end of flight. From this data, information for the correction of the failure was obtained. The Jupiter is a single-stage ballistic missile. It is finless, and control of the missile is accomplished during main thrust by swiveling the motor. The missile weighs approximately 110,000 pounds when fueled. After being launched vertically, it is programmed onto a ballistic trajectory. After power cutoff, the aft section will be separated from the forward section. The forward section will maintain its attitude tangent to the trajectory until it re-enters the atmosphere. Jupiter flew first in 1957. And in that year, Sputnik 1 was placed in orbit. With that single act of rocketry, the character of international endeavor was abruptly altered. It made mandatory the immediate utilization of military rocket systems as space taxis. In January of 1958, 
start a Jupiter C vehicle hurled into orbit the first U.S. satellite, Explorer 1. Only six weeks after Sputnik 2, the first American satellite was placed in orbit by a modified redstone with a thrust of 83,000 pounds. Its payload discovered the Van Allen radiation belt. On July 26, 1958, ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, approved the program for a clustered engine booster with 1.5 million pounds of thrust. The clustering of already designed Jupiter and Redstone hardware would save both time and money. On August 15, 1958, the Saturn project was assigned to the experienced group that had developed Redstone, Jupiter C, Juno 1, and launched the Explorer satellites. The Saturn 1 program began at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency under the leadership of Dr. Werner von Braun and Major General John B. Medeiros. The purpose of the program under Advanced Research Projects Agency, Order 1459, was to develop a one and one half million pound thrust clustered engine first stage. Shortly thereafter, the program was expanded to the development of a reliable three stage heavy launch vehicle for scientific payloads. Where only pounds had been lifted before, Tons of weight would be blasted into orbit to explore space, in which we had only begun to pioneer. And in July 1958, NASA was born. During March 1960, technical and administrative control of the Saturn program was transferred from ARPA to NASA. In July, the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center was activated. The nucleus of the center was the Von Braun team of rocket experts. In September 1960, that part of Redstone Arsenal transferred to NASA was formally dedicated as the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center. President Eisenhower had long ago stated his belief that outer space should be used for peaceful purposes. Aeronautical and space scientific activities sponsored by the United States should be, he said, under the direction of a civilian agency. Now, this was an accomplished fact and the president had this to say. We are propelled in these efforts by ingenuity and industry, by courage to overcome disappointment and failure, by free-ranging imagination, by insistence upon excellence. In this fact is proof again that hard work, toughness of spirit, and self-reliant enterprise are not mere catchwords in an era dead and gone. They remain the imperatives for the fulfillment of America's dream. Not push buttons, nor electronic devices, but superlative human qualities have brought success and fame to this place. Defined, Saturn is a rocket vehicle system of great flexibility designed to serve over an extended period as the multi-purpose workhorse of peaceful space exploration. Prime objective, to contribute to the priority national space goal, manned lunar landings. The requirement, develop quickly the big booster. Use available, reliable hardware. Create a flyable first stage, producing thrust in the order of one and a half million pounds. This power output was almost four times the power of any rocket propulsion system in this country. Indicated was a task involving clustering proven engines, tankage, feed systems, and associated hardware, all combined in totally unprecedented multiples. Saturn C1 configuration. 
the booster or first stage called S1, the S4 or second stage, the S5 or third stage. The contract was signed July 28th with Douglas Aircraft Company for the S4 stage, second stage of the Saturn C1 vehicle, the first flight configuration. This one-tenth scale model depicts the actual S4, approximately 41 feet long and 18 feet in diameter, as it will appear upon completion. Plastic cutaways reveal significant portions of vehicle structure, such as engine assembly, and the common bulkhead and oxygen tank. Shown in close-up are the S4's retro rockets, haulage rockets, and pressurized helium spheres. Convair Astronautics is conducting studies for adaption of Centaur-type hardware for use as the Saturn's third stage, called S5. Dummy upper stages are being made to be flown on the first few flight vehicles where only the booster will be powered. Pending evaluation, it was decided to delay development contracting. Convair's continuing study, however, is expected to re-emphasize possible Saturn use of the Centaur stage with minimum changes to existing hardware rather than development of a new S5 stage. A configuration redesign of the Saturn C1 Space Vehicle Second or S4 stage was one of several significant program changes occurring during 1961. Formerly, four Pratt & Whitney XLR-119 engines were to have been used, each developing 17,500 pounds of thrust for a stage thrust of 70,000 pounds. The S4 stage will now be powered by six Pratt & Whitney engines designated as RL-10A3, using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Each develops 15,000 pounds of thrust for a total stage thrust of 90,000 pounds. During May 1961, the Saturn was changed from a three-stage scientific satellite launch vehicle to a two-stage man-rated vehicle to support the Apollo program. The design changes caused this decision to be effective with the fifth flight. Slight changes in the names of Saturn vehicles were announced by NASA during this quarter in the interest of simplification. New designations for the Saturn C-1, C-1B, and C-5 are now Saturn 1, 1B, and 5, respectively. In Saturn, the propulsion system has enough muscle to carry science into deep space. This initial version of Saturn embodies the multi-stage concept. The propulsion system is integrated into vehicle design and function throughout the separate stages. Each stage, successively, thrusts the Saturn to greater height and velocity. The payload, riding at the top of the vehicle, is finally released in space at the point calculated to perform its planned mission. Here, and here, are the individual rocket engines grouped in clusters, tied together to function as a single unit. First, the basic engine. Chosen was an improved and uprated unit of high reliability, seasoned in the IRBM and ICBM programs. The H1, a liquid propellant engine using RP-1 fuel and liquid oxygen, could produce 188,000 pounds of thrust. The eight engines are set in two square patterns. Inner engines are rigidly mounted and canted slightly to concentrate thrust vectors close to center of gravity. In the outer pattern, engines are canted outward to a greater degree and can be gimbaled. Gimbaling or swiveling is the means of directional control of the vehicle. For by command signals from the guidance computer, the engine gimbaling can alter the direction of its thrust and thus the direction of the entire rocket. Nine propellant tanks are clustered vertically above the engines. A center tank of Jupiter diameter and four redstone diameter outer tanks carry liquid oxygen. Fuel is carried in the four remaining outer tanks. The booster tanks carry a total of 750,000 pounds of propellant, 
which, through a manifolding system, can be gulped dry by the engines in less than two minutes. The manifolds delivering the propellant have an interchange capability so that any tank can feed any engine, and propellant levels in all tanks are maintained equal during depletion. At the top end of the booster, 48 fiberglass spheres store the gaseous nitrogen used to pressurize fuel tanks. This, during operation, helps to maintain uniform propellant flow. Liquid oxygen tanks are pressurized by gaseous oxygen tapped from engine heat exchangers. Upper stage engines are smaller, producing 15,000 pounds of thrust and designed for efficiency at high altitudes. But these engines gain a high energy value by using liquid hydrogen as fuel. Hydrogen permits an energy increase of more than 50% over the more conventional kerosene used in booster engines. However, to use the hydrogen-liquid-oxygen combination, engineers have had to learn how to handle and apply hydrogen, an extremely reactive element. In its liquid state, it is so cold, it boils at 423 degrees below zero. The A3 version of the RL-10 liquid hydrogen rocket engine, a mock-up of which is shown at left alongside an A1 engine, is being developed with higher specific impulse for the Saturn S4 stage and advanced Centaur vehicles. Minimum modifications to the A1 engine, such as this propellant utilization valve, and this hydrogen collector manifold are being incorporated into the A3 for improved performance. Engine development was rapid. First full power firing at the Santa Susana test site in California took place only three months after the go-ahead date. Engineers of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration are developing the propulsion elements of the Saturn vehicles. Here, held fast in the static test stand at Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama, a booster section undergoes full duration firing. From the first, performance met all expectations. April 29, 1960, all eight engines firing as a unit according to plan for the first time produced more than one million pounds of thrust. firings of the test booster SAT4.5 were held with engines developing one and a half million pounds thrust. Test objectives were to check integrity of the propulsion system and effect of the 188K engines on the flame deflector. Preliminary flight rating endurance testing of the S4 stages RL10 A3 engine was successfully completed on June 9th by the engine contractor, Pratt & Whitney, at West Palm Beach, Florida. Twenty-six PFRT firings totaling 4,096 seconds were conducted. Initial inspection showed the engine to be in good condition. A series on non-firing gimbal tests of the RL-10 A3 using Douglas Aircraft Company plumbing connections was also carried out. Various gimbal angles and frequencies were applied to the engine to simulate the worst expected flight conditions. Both engine and vehicle plumbing withstood the tests satisfactorily. Permit me to use here a model of Launch Complex 34. The main element of the Saturn C1 complex are the launch pad, which is approximately 120 meters in diameter. In the center is a launch table. 360 meters away is a blockhouse, which is a launch control center or the nerve center of the operation. This particular control center is igloo shaped and contains two floors. 
other elements of the 40-acre complex are the facilities for storage and automatic fuel transfer of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, fuel, and the transfer lines, as well as a high-pressure storage area necessary for the fueling of the space vehicle before launch. The movable service structure is 310 feet high. It is used to erect and check out the vehicle. After its job is completed, it is moved under its own power approximately 182 meters. This is considered to be the minimum distance in order to protect the tower from an explosion caused by a space vehicle falling back onto the pad. A three-story pedestal supports and retains the vehicle during checkout and launch operation. The donut-shaped torus ring around the center opening is part of the water deluge system. Construction progress is on schedule at Launch Complex 37, being built to handle launching of Block 2 vehicles. Complex 37 will have two Saturn launch positions, utilizing a single control center and service tower. Work includes construction of the mobile 3,500-ton steel service structure, 268-foot-high umbilical tower and steel launch pedestal, circular concrete blockhouse, locks and fuel storage facilities, and servicing facilities. The new combination support and hold-down arms for Block 2 launch pedestals will support and hold down the Saturn vehicle after ignition until proper thrust condition for liftoff. The prime mission of the first Saturn flights was to verify first stage design and prove out launch facilities. On launch complex 34, the first Saturn I countdown began not too long ago, on October 27, 1961. At 10.06 a.m. Friday, October 27th, the powerful 162-foot-tall rocket roared from its launch pedestal. Liftoff came 3.9 seconds after beginning of ignition. As planned, only three-tenths of a second separated ignition of all eight H1 engines, which generated thrust levels of 165,000 pounds each for a scheduled total stage thrust of 1.3 million pounds. Overall performance of the booster during flight was considered highly satisfactory. Wind shear encountered near the region of maximum dynamic pressure resulted in a predicted four and a half degree engine deflection. But the disturbance was handled by the control system without difficulty. Structural integrity of the booster was maintained throughout. Performance of the propulsion system was very good. Ignition, transitions, main stage and cutoff were as expected with the measured combustion chamber pressures showing no major deviations. For the first research and development flights of Saturn, the two upper stages are not powered. The second stage is merely a water-filled passenger, an aerodynamic component. The third stage, a modified Centaur, is also inert here. This, the first Saturn, does not carry an active payload. After the firing, inspection of ground support equipment and firing accessories indicated that only minor damage normally sustained for a flight of such nature was experienced. General condition of the GSE was better than expected. All right, Mr. Captain. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 
Build up and lift off were normal. Objectives of the SA 2 launch included flight testing of the booster stage and operational testing of associated launch facilities. Structural integrity of the Block 1 airframe and aerodynamic characteristics were confirmed, and capabilities of the control system demonstrated. The propulsion system performed normally throughout powered flight. All electrical networks and instrumentation functioned properly with very satisfactory telemetry signals received. Maximum velocity of over 3,700 miles per hour was attained. The sloshing effects observed during the SA-1 flight was reduced to an acceptable level. Cutoff occurred at 110 seconds for inboard engines and 116 seconds for outboard, as predicted. In virtually every respect, the SA-2 flight was successful. SA-2 also carried out a secondary or bonus scientific experiment known as Project Highwater. At an altitude of 65 miles, the vehicle, whose dummy upper stages carried 23,000 gallons of water as ballast, was purposely exploded to investigate the optical, ionospheric, and meteorological effects which water vapor has on the high atmosphere. About 15% of the water evaporated, and the remaining 85 tons formed a cloud of very small ice particles along the remainder of the vehicle trajectory. The mighty Saturn is almost ready for launch. And Dr. Werner von Braun, a pioneer in liquid fuel rockets and NASA director of the Saturn program monitors the count. SA-3 performed several additional missions contributing to development of the Block II, SA-5 and beyond version of the vehicle. For example, an engineering model of the ST-124 stabilized platform was carried as a functional passenger, though not in control. And although no stage separation was attempted, Block II retro rockets were successfully test fired. The booster carried a full load of propellant, some 750,000 pounds, instead of the 620,000 pounds carried earlier. SA-3's weight was almost as great as that of later vehicles, which will have 188,000 pound thrust engines although SA-3's eight H-1 engines were rated at 165,000 pounds thrust each. SA-3 was the most heavily instrumented rocket ever launched by the United States, transmitting 716 measurements to ground stations. Analysis of telemetry data indicated that the vehicle performed precisely as expected. SA-3 reached maximum altitude of 104 miles, range was 270 miles, and velocity 4,000 miles per hour. Flight time to impact was slightly over eight minutes. SA-3's two inert upper stages laden with 95 tons of water simulating fuel were deliberately exploded on schedule at 104 miles altitude, 292 seconds after liftoff in a study of the basic physics of the ionosphere. Satisfactory data on this experiment, known as Project High Water, were recorded. A similar experiment had been conducted on the SA-2 flight. More damage was done to ground support equipment by SA-3 than on previous launches because of lower liftoff acceleration resulting from the additional 160,000 pounds of propellant. However, damage was not considered excessive. SA-4. Primary objective of this test was to check booster performance with one engine shut down in flight. Several minor technical difficulties during the countdown, mostly in ground support equipment, delayed the firing about one and a half hours. Some components of future Saturns were attached to the inert second stage. Control accelerometers were used actively for the first time. Flown as a passenger was the engineering model of the ST-124 stabilized platform, which will be used actively beginning with the sixth Saturn. A Mistrum system transponder was also flown on a passenger basis. 
A cue ball angle of attack device was mounted in the nose cone and several sections of new heat shield insulation at the tail section were tested. At 100 seconds following liftoff, engine number five was deliberately cut off, but the vehicle held on course while the propellant distribution system channeled the remaining fuel into the other seven engines, extending burning time two seconds to compensate for loss of thrust. SA-4 reached maximum altitude of 81 miles, range of 232 statute miles, at a peak velocity of 3,847 miles per hour. SA-5, first of the Block II series, including fins, lower shrouds, and engine skirts. Fin design utilizes the spar, rib, and skin type structure which provides a high degree of structural reliability. Three basic fin configurations are used. Four large fins will be located at 90 degree intervals around the booster. Two configurations of stub fins will be located at right angles to each other between the large fins. Three of these have provisions for venting liquid hydrogen from the vehicle's second stage. In addition to providing flight stability, these eight fins have vehicle support and hold-down fittings. The lower shroud is basically a corrugated skin structure with continuous rings supporting the entire unit. Also slated for initial use on SA-5 is a new camera eject mechanism which will help to provide a photographic record of vehicle actions. Along the spider beam of the SA-5 booster, eight movie camera pods and para-balloon recovery packages will be mounted into ejection cylinders. The design of the S-4 stage and its operational systems required considerable pioneering. Several unique features are incorporated in the S-4 airframe, which must support the weight of its own 100,000 pounds of cryogenic propellants, plus the weight of the instrumentation unit. This unit, weighing approximately 5,000 pounds, contained the Saturn vehicle's guidance and control package. The payload compartment was a modified Jupiter nose cone ballasted to weigh approximately 18,000 pounds. These three sections, the S-4 stage, the instrumentation unit, and the payload, would not be separated, but would go into orbit as a single unit, weighing a total of 19 and a half tons. 38,685 pounds. On November the 16th, 1963, Air Force One touched down at the Cape Skid Strip, bringing President Kennedy on his third visit to America's spaceport. He was welcomed by Major General Leighton I. Davis, commander of the Air Force Missile Test Center, NASA Administrator James Webb, and NASA Launch Operations Center Director Kurt Davis. Stopping outside the Saturn blockhouse on Complex 37 for a Project Gemini briefing by Air Force astronauts Cooper and Grissom. After another briefing inside the blockhouse on Project Apollo, the President and his party, which included Florida's Senator Smathers, drove to the base of the giant Saturn. Saturn will carry an American crew to the moon in this decade, a goal established by the young President shortly after he took office in 1961. The president then boarded a nearby helicopter for an aerial tour of the space launch areas and a 30-mile flight to the USS Observation Island. The primary objective of this mission is to flight test the Saturn I vehicle, which consists of an S-1 first stage and an S-4 second stage. For the S-4 stage, the major objectives are to achieve separation from the S-1 stage, to affect in-flight ignition of liquid hydrogen-fueled engines, to achieve engine operation until fuel depletion, and to place in the desired orbit the spent S-4 stage and the payload. Countdown was begun on January 28. The count proceeded to launch, which was accomplished on January 29 at 11.25 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seven, six, 
six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off plus two, three, four, five. Operation of the booster stage was nominal. First stage burning time was as planned. The S-4 engine chill-down operation, which was begun prior to separation, was successfully accomplished. At first stage engine burnout, the S-4 Ullage rockets ignited. All enabling events were accomplished, and a successful separation was achieved. After separation, ignition of all six S-4 engines occurred as planned. Thrust levels were estimated to be nominal. Ignition and operation of the helium heater was satisfactory throughout the flight. The spent ullage rockets were jettisoned as planned. Step pressurization of the liquid hydrogen tank was accomplished. During the flight, operation of the S-4 telemetry system was satisfactory. Propellants were depleted as planned, and engine cutoff was accomplished as planned. Propellant utilization was estimated to be close to 100%. Operation of the flight control system was satisfactory throughout the flight, and at engine cutoff, the flight path was very close to nominal. The vehicle payload combination went into an orbit having an apogee of 425 nautical miles and a perigee of 142 nautical miles. SA-6 was the first to place into orbit an Apollo boilerplate command and propulsion module. The payload, designed to eventually carry three men to the moon and weighing more than 37,000 pounds, was one of the largest ever orbited. Secondary objectives included testing of structural and flight control systems and jettisoning of the escape tower in flight. The first unmanned boilerplate model of the Apollo spacecraft was carried by SA-6 into Earth orbit along with the empty S-4 stage. The SA-6 satellite, weighing a total of 37,300 pounds, completed 50 orbits before re-entering the atmosphere and disintegrating over the Pacific Ocean. This sequence, photographed from a tracking aircraft, emphasizes the size of the flame or plume compared to the vehicle. The pencil-shaped shock pattern, or Mach cone, a factor of the velocity and expansion of exhaust gases occurring at Mach 1, can be seen just below the plume. One of the eight H1 engines of the S1 stage cut off 24 seconds prematurely due to a turbo pump assembly failure. The disturbance, or flare-up, caused by the cutoff can be seen at the upper left of the flame pattern. Deviation from the planned trajectory caused by the engine out was corrected by the guidance system. Continuing to track the vehicle, we see a typical flare-up as inboard engine cutoff occurs. A few seconds later, the outboard engines cut off. Then the ullage rockets are fired, retro rockets are fired, and the S-4 stage separates and moves off to the right. This S-4 separation sequence was photographed through a fiber optics cable located inside the interstage. Swirling gas around the engines at separation was oxygen, resulting from LOX chill-down. Another fiber optics camera was designed to view the LOX SOX dispersal system. The flashing light at center is a strobe light used to illuminate another photographic sequence. Four of the RL-10 engines of the S-4 stage can be seen. After blowout panel initiation, the S-4 stage separates and lifts out of the interstage. Sunlight shining through the blowout panels as the booster begins to tumble creates the ghost-like effect moving through the interstage.
This sequence was photographed by one of the cameras as it was being ejected from the booster. The white spots are solid particles of oxygen floating by. As a result of this kind of excellent performance, SA-6 was the last Saturn I R&D vehicle instead of SA-10 as originally scheduled. The rest would be operational vehicles. SA-7 countdown started in the early morning of September 18th. The payload, a boilerplate Apollo spacecraft, and flight missions were very similar to those of SA-6, successfully launched last quarter. The launch vehicle contained minor changes made to improve overall performance. Liftoff occurred at 11.22 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. SA-7 flight objectives included retesting of vehicle propulsion, structural guidance and flight control systems, and providing additional data on Apollo boilerplate behavior during powered flight. In addition, the spacecraft launch escape system was successfully jettisoned, and the S-4's recently added non-propulsive vent system successfully tested. The purpose of this new vent system is to reduce payload spin and tumble. For the first time, the ST-124 guidance system platform was in complete control of the entire vehicle. S-4 stage flight was as expected. The boilerplate spacecraft was successfully placed into a low orbit, closely approximating the parking orbit for future manned exploration missions. For SA-9 and SA-8, a two-ton meteoroid detection satellite is being developed by the Fairchild Stratus Corporation, Hagerstown, Maryland. During launch, the satellite will be housed in the service module. Flight experiment results will provide a better understanding of meteoroid hazards encountered in spaceflight. After injection and separation of the boilerplate spacecraft, the satellite remains attached to the S-4 stage and deploys two large flat wings, 10 feet wide with a total wingspan of 96 feet by a system of scissor-like links driven by an electric motor. The major objective of SA-9 was inserting the Pegasus Meteoroid Technology Satellite into Earth orbit. Other objectives included testing a completely closed loop guidance system for the second time and an iterative guidance mode for the first time. Liftoff occurred on February 16th at 9.37 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The SA-9 launch marked the eighth successful flight of the Marshall-built boosters and the fourth straight successful flight of the Douglas S-4 stages. The SA-9 booster was the last to be built at Marshall. The two remaining Saturn I boosters were built by Chrysler at Marshall's Michoud operations. The first stage burned for 145 seconds and separation occurred satisfactorily. The S-4 stage burned about 474 seconds, at which time the programmed cutoff velocity was obtained. S-4 stage flight was satisfactory. The first flight of an operational unpressurized type instrument unit was also successful. The Apollo command and service module was jettisoned from the second stage by spring mechanisms, leaving the Pegasus wings free to unfold as revealed by onboard TV cameras. The wings successfully deployed to the full open position. Data from Pegasus confirmed that the Apollo spacecraft design is adequate to protect astronauts from meteoroids. SA-8 and SA-10 will also launch Pegasus satellites. Vehicle liftoff occurred on May 25th at 2.35 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. SA-8, the first vehicle to use a Chrysler-built booster, was the ninth straight successful Saturn. 
The first stage burned for 148 seconds and separation was good. The second stage burned about 474 seconds, obtaining programmed cutoff velocity. Stage performance was satisfactory. The Apollo Command and Service Module jettisoned mechanically and the Pegasus wing successfully deployed. Pegasus B's roll rate was 6.6 .6 degrees per second as compared to Pegasus A's roll rate of 9.8 degrees. Pegasus B, like its predecessor, is successfully obtaining information concerning quantity and penetrating ability of meteoroids in the near-Earth orbit. SA-10, the final Saturn I flight vehicle, launched Pegasus III. SA-10 liftoff occurred at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The first stage, the second manufactured by the Chrysler Corporation, burned for 148 seconds, separated, and fell away. The Douglas Belt second stage burned about 480 seconds, obtaining programmed cutoff velocity and altitude. Stage performance was normal, placing the Pegasus in the required orbit. The successful launch of the 10th and final Saturn I launch vehicle, SA-10, closed out one of the most successful R&D programs in the history of rocketry. The Saturn I program has provided more than a heavy launch vehicle. It has provided the technological base now being used in developing Saturn IB and Saturn V. Each vehicle of the program established new levels of rocket reliability far above those of 16 years earlier. 42 and a half, 43. Eight Eight Forty-five. Time pressure a program providing the foundation for the follow-on advanced Saturn programs. The uprated Saturn I. All engines building up thrust. Moving out. Clear the tower. And Saturn V. All engines are We have liftoff. We have liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard. 